speak too long. I just want to introduce our topic, which is the growth impact and consequences of consumer debt collection. If this is intended to be a seminar more than a training. We wanted to focus on the need for legal representation in debt collection matters rather than just strictly training. I do hope to follow up soon with the training on how to handle debt collection cases through VIP. And I will keep you all posted about that date, uh, that date when we have it. Um, there are people joining the room. Oh, there we go. Okay. Uh, so with that, I'll just tell you a little bit about VIP and then I'll introduce, well, I'll allow our presenters to briefly introduce themselves and then we can get started with the program. Our presenters are Stacey Rupert Butler, the Director of Innovation for Justice Program at the University of Arizona, um, and Louis Rui, who is a great volunteer for VIP and a pra uh, practice professor of law at UPenn, and Katie Marner, Katie Martin, I apologize, Katie, who is a senior manager at Pew Charitable Trust. Our agenda for the day, obviously, I just said it was introductions, program overview, our discussion on the topic, and then questions if we have time. And I will briefly go over how you can volunteer with VIP if you haven't done so previously. Program overview, we were founded in 1981 as a, um, uh, an arm of the Philadelphia Bar Association. Our association. I apologize in advance. I am struggling today with allergies. Um, our main function is to recruit and train and support volunteer attorneys to provide free legal services to low income individuals, families, businesses, and nonprofits. Why VIP matters. Uh, Philadelphia is the poorest big city in the country. Um, with a population of about, I'm going to mess up all of my statistics, so I apologize. Um, I forget the numbers. I am terribly off my game today and I truly apologize. But the fact is we are one of the poorest cities in the country. And with that comes issues with being able to secure legal representation for the things that matter most in your life, like custody and family law issues, debt collection, obviously, home ownership and probate issues. Um, VIP tries to assist all the people that come to us, but we're obviously not able to do that. Um, we really look to our volunteers to bridge that gap there's over 10,000 attorneys in Philadelphia and we have maybe a tenth of that number that actually volunteer with us. And our goal is to always recruit more attorneys where we can and get them to help us with this growing need in Philadelphia. The benefits of volunteering with VIP, obviously pro bono is good for the soul. Do something good for other people and yourself as well. The experience for fairly new attorneys or just Attorneys that are not familiar with other areas of law, this is a great way to gain experience in that. Attorneys who wouldn't otherwise be in courtroom settings, this is a way to get that experience and resources as well. If you've never looked at our resource library on our website, there are several training manuals, all types of forms, and resources available to our volunteers to help them get through any case type that they may be unfamiliar with. And then obviously the networking. You'll probably um, meet other attorneys that you haven't otherwise had a chance to connect with. If you need help, we pair, pair people with mentors in particular fields. And then we have events. We haven't had a lot lately because of COVID obviously, but there is our yearly gala, which should be coming up for our anniversary year. Um, and then I will move on away from talking about VIP to allow our uh, presenters to introduce themselves. We're gonna get started with Stacy, And Stacy, I will turn it over to you. Hey, thank you. Share my screen. Is that working for everyone? Okay, yes. great. Uh, my name is Stacy Butler. I direct the Innovation for Justice program at the University of Arizona. Um, I'm going to open the session today by talking a little bit about um, the downstream consequences of debt collection from a national perspective. So uh, a little bit about the work we do at Innovation for Justice. We are a social justice innovation lab that designs, builds, and tests disruptive solutions to the justice gap. Uh, we've been operating virtually during COVID, which has actually been a really great opportunity for us to um, do more work in other jurisdictions. 
So um, with every project that we do, we apply a combined design and systems thinking problem solving approach, which means um, we approach any social justice problem with um, an empathy lens first. So understanding that problem from the perspective of the people experiencing the problem, uh, then trying to unpack what we learn from the community, think creatively around solution building, um, and then taking prototype versions of possible innovations back out to the community so the community can weigh in on whether that solution works for them. Um, we're layering into that design thinking, the systems thinking approach, because we're talking about very complex problem solving. And so uh, we need to talk to a lot of different people um, in the system. So diverse stakeholders, um, engagement with diverse stakeholders at the outset of a project, um, but really focusing on um, instead of just this is a legal problem that happens in the courts, um, what's happening before that legal problem, what's upstream and what's downstream if we don't do something about that problem. Um, and that, that downstream focus is where I'll be um, really emphasizing the work today. Um, we have about 11 projects in Innovation for Justice right now, but three of them are really specifically targeting consumer debt. Um, and so when I share some national statistics with you today in a case study on a project we're doing in Utah, um, my work really comes from these projects that are running now. So nationally, debt collection um, is really a, a huge issue for America. Um, the annual revenue of the U.S. collection agency industry, $12.7 billion. There's roughly 7,000 collection agencies collecting debt in this country, and approximately one in four civil cases in the country are debt collection cases. So it is the largest piece of civil litigation in the U.S., so large I made a whole separate bullet saying that, single most common type of civil litigation. Um, we have seen debt collection suits double in the past um, couple of decades. Um, we're now at 4 million debt collection lawsuits nationwide. Um, and in 44 states, people can still be arrested and held for failure to appear in court um, or for failure to provide financial um, information. So pretty, pretty significant downstream consequence. Um, and um, right now we have a big failure to engage issue with debt collection. So most people who are sued for debt collection in the US do not respond to the lawsuit and end up with a default judgment. Uh, that default judgment also carries significant downstream consequences. So they may be subject to uh, interest in attorney's fees. Uh, so the debt is exacerbated by engagement with the civil legal system. Um, and then that uh, default judgment can become grounds for wage garnishment. Um, can be a lien on your property. Right now, one in 14 US workers are having their paychecks garnished. Um, debt collection is a common cause of wage garnishment. Um, the connection between race and debt. So debt collection judgments in communities of color are nearly twice that of white communities um, and black and Latino communities are more likely to be a target for really harmful consumer debt like payday lending. Um, we see that 42% of communities of color of debt and collection compared to 26% of white communities. Um, when we talk to people about their experiences with debt collection, um, we hear these kind of common themes about why people are not engaging with the civil legal system when it comes to debt collection. One is that they don't feel like they have the money to pay the debt. Um, but another is that they don't even understand what the debt is or where it came from. They don't have any way to uh, dispute the validity of the debt. They don't know how to engage with the court system to argue that the debt is invalid. Um, they don't know how to uh, try to problem solve with the debt collection agency. There can be very tense or non-existent communication between plaintiffs and defendants in debt collection. Um, and then another big problem that we're exploring now is whether defendants even know about the debt lawsuit at all. So um, some service of process issues. Um, we also see that if we can connect representation for defendants in debt collection, we can really shift outcomes in debt collection. So um, lots of empirical studies demonstrating that um, judgments are being issued against defendants in debt collection lawsuits. Um, and if that defendant had had representation, someone to suss the case for valid defenses, those defenses would have existed. Um, not surprisingly, people who are trying to navigate the system without representation uh, consistently report feeling very lost and confused um, by trying to navigate a civil legal system that was really designed by lawyers for lawyers. Um, this is some statistics out of Utah. So we're doing a, a project on medical debt in Utah right now. And when we pulled the court data and analyzed it, we found that um, in about 99.9% .9 of the debt collection, consumer debt collection lawsuits in Utah, the plaintiff has representation um, and 98% of the time the defendant does not. 
If defendants do have representation though, um, pretty significant outcome disparities. So 53% of defendants with representation are winning debt collection cases versus 19% of self-represented defendants. Again, this is specific to Utah. Uh, we also found that if you have representation, even if you uh, maybe don't completely prevail, you at least uh, decrease your odds of wage garnishment. So 30% of defendants with representation um, ended up with wage garnishment versus 52% of self-represented defendants in Utah. Wanted to talk to you a little bit about some of the changes we're seeing as we um, watch what's happening in debt collection in the US. Um, New York has done some really important work on debt collection reform. Um, so and this was really judge driven, as you'll see from this quote. Um, so they have new rules about debt collection and providing proof of default judgment, including affidavits, supporting exhibits, and information on the statute of limitations. Massachusetts has also adopted some new rules around affidavits and supporting documents earlier in the litigation. So again, targeting that issue of defendants not knowing whether the debt is valid or how to dispute the validity of the debt. Um, North Carolina has been requiring some similar um, proof at the time of filing the complaint. Um, Oregon has created this consumer debt collection disclosure statement that delivers some consumer protection into the court system. Um, and then technology. So some courts are starting to utilize their own um, uh, data to better understand what's happening with debt collection in their jurisdiction. Um, we have an increasing number of courts that are digitizing their court files. So that gives defendants access to portions of the debt collection case that they might not otherwise have been able to obtain um, when it required a trip to the courthouse and, a, and waiting in line at the clerk's window. Um, some video conferencing may be increasing or other remote connections with the courts may be increasing participation in debt collection. I think the jury is still out on whether this is um, statistically significant uptick in participation. Um, and then some interesting innovations in service of process. So um, what the analogy I often hear here is like, well, Amazon, when they deliver a package to your house, sends you a photo of the package at your door, and so surely process servers could be doing that same thing. And we are seeing that in some communities, process servers are using GPS tools and other technologies um, to assure the court and the plaintiffs they represent that the service was legitimate and valid. Um, also, uh, increase in non-lawyer navigators. So this is an interesting movement that's happening in the courts, not just for debt collection, but including debt collection. Um, these are non-lawyers who can't give legal advice, but they can give legal information, um, and they're positioned within the court to help people connect with resources and understand how the system works. Um, we have 23 non-lawyer navigator programs in 15 states, including D.C. Um, and the I think the, the goal of non-lawyer navigators is this access to justice piece, helping demystify the court system for self-represented litigants. Uh, so that's just a quick overview. I'm just sharing this information. We won't take time for questions now. We're saving time for questions at the end. Uh, but if you want more information about the Innovation for Justice program, or if you have questions for me, there's my email and uh, my website. And thanks for your time today. And now we'll turn it over to Katie Martin. Thanks, Katie. Thank you so much, Denise, and thank you so much, Stacey. Um, my name is Katie Martin. I am the Senior Manager in the Philadelphia Research and Policy Initiative at the Pew Charitable Trusts. Um, let me share my screen. Sorry, that's the wrong button. I hope you can all see it. Um, so uh, the Philadelphia Research and Policy Initiative, we really seek to inform um, discussions on important issues facing the city and the region um, through data and rigorous research. Um, we, I'm really excited to be here this afternoon to talk about the research that we're doing on Philadelphia Municipal Court. And I'm really going to focus on two main areas of our research. So one, um, the first is what were small claim defendants' experiences before they went to court, while they were in court, and after court was completed. And then secondly, what were the outcomes for defendants with and without counsel um, in these cases? Uh, Pew examined Philadelphia Municipal Court for a couple of reasons. Um, one, it's the people's court. It's the lowest jurisdictional court in the city. And the most number of Philadelphians who touch the judicial system will go through municipal court, either for a small claims case, for a landlord-tenant case, or traffic court. 
Um, other than jury duty, it really is the part of the judicial system that the most Philadelphians will interact with uh, in the city. Secondly, um, in addition, the pandemic um, has really impacted how many Philadelphians are experiencing issues with unemployment, with debt, and with financial issues and insecurity. Pew uh, performed a survey of Philadelphians last summer. Um, it was put into the field in July and August of 2020. Uh, we released it in October 2020, and it showed that 32% of Philadelphians said that they or members of their household have fallen behind on credit cards or other bills since the beginning of the pandemic. And again, that was only from last summer. This is, this is now going on for a year. Uh, small claims court, it was already a high volume court, and it's likely that we're going to see more cases coming through this system in the years to come. Um, there really was an increase in the number of cases um, after the 2008-2009 financial crisis, and we're likely to see um, a reprisal of that. Uh, so to begin, um, Philadelphia Municipal Court sees approximately 90,000 cases every year. That includes landlord tenant and small claims and all the cases coming through there. There are 25 to 30,000 small claims cases um, and filings that happen every year. Um, these are cases are filed for less than $12,000, often much less than that, less than $5,000 generally. And the defendants in these cases are most likely to be individuals who are being sued by a business or a creditor over allegedly unpaid debts. Um, so to begin with, this slide shows per capita where defendants who had a small claims case in municipal court live in Philadelphia. Uh, primarily, defendants live in Philadelphia's middle and lower income neighborhoods uh, in West Philadelphia, and also particularly in North Philadelphia in neighborhoods like West Oak Lane, East Mount Airy, Olney, and Feltonville. Um, this is meant to show that it's not evenly distributed across the city. Um, Pew performed, as I mentioned at the beginning, a survey of defendants to a small claims case in municipal court in 2018. So we wanted to learn more about what were the experiences of defendants um, when they went to court? What, what brought them to court um, while they were there? And then afterward, what was the impact of the case on their lives and on their finances? So as you can see, overwhelmingly, consumer debt and credit cards are the reasons why people were sued and brought to municipal court. 59% said it was a credit card, a charge card, or bank card that caused their case. We also asked, um, for, at the request of the court, to learn more about what were the circumstances that brought people to um, into court. So 30% indicated that there was a major life event that prevented them from uh, paying off the debt that they acquired. 40% um, of our survey respondents uh, attended their hearing, uh, while 60% did not attend their hearing. Um, of those who did attend, 51% uh, said that taking off from work or school was the barrier to attending court. 56% uh, indicated that it was transportation or parking, kind of finding a place to, or getting to Center City was a real barrier for attending court. And then 20% indicated that childcare was a challenge. Um, we had expected that to be a little higher, but I think um, this was, you know, the year, this was 2018 when the survey, people who had a case in 2018, and a lot of children were still in school at that time. Um, and so uh, childcare was less of a challenge than we had anticipated. Um, of the 60% who indicated that they did not attend their hearing, 22% said they did not know that a case had been filed against them in court, and 13% said they could not get off of work or arrange child care. And I do want to say that everybody who was surveyed in our case were indicated in court records that they had received successful service. Um, we also wanted to ask people if they agreed or disagreed with some statements about their experiences while they were in court. So this first one, 62% of respondents disagreed with the statement that both sides are treated equally in municipal court, meaning that both the plaintiff and the defendant are treated equally by the court. 85% agreed that defendants need a lawyer in order to defend themselves in municipal court. And again, um, this court, you're, it's meant to be a court in which you do not have to have an attorney, but 85% of a respondent said that they really felt that they needed an attorney while they were in that court. And only 44% agreed that it's easy to understand what's happening to you in your case when you're in municipal court. We also asked, kind of, what were their experiences after this case was complete? 
Um, 22%, they fell behind on other bills or had their utilities disconnected. 16% said they went without food, transportation, or other basic needs in order to pay back their debt. 14% uh, said they felt relief um, that the debt had been paid. But I, I do want to point at the bottom here, you see 39%, almost 40%, said there was not a negative consequence to their experience after the case was complete. Um, what these findings from the survey show is that a lot of Philadelphians are being brought to court for small claims cases, and they don't understand all the need, information that they really need to, to uh, understand and defend themselves in their case, and uh, the consequences that happen after their case, particularly for those without representation. Um, we also conducted an analysis of small claims cases that were in the court between 2013 and 2018. We found that over that time, 91% of plaintiffs had an attorney for a small claims case, whereas only 12% of defendants did. Um, and even though you don't need an attorney to defend yourself in municipal court, court data and stakeholder accounts, as I mentioned earlier, really indicate that having an attorney makes a big difference. Um, this first graphic, it shows the outcomes for defendants who do not have counsel. And as you can see, 88% of all cases defendants do not have counsel. Um, half ended in a default judgment for the plaintiff. Um, a third were dismissed for no service. So that means in more than 80% of these cases, a defendant does not have the opportunity to defend themselves either by not appearing in court or not receiving service. And as I highlighted earlier, there really are barriers for people to go to court and there are serious repercussions afterwards for receiving a default judgment on your, for their case. Um, in comparison, these were the outcomes for defendants who had an attorney um, or had counsel, uh, which was 12% of the cases. 17% um, ended in a default judgment um, as compared to 50%, and a quarter were dismissed for no service. Um, and I do want to highlight, because so few defendants had counsel, it was only 735 cases resulted in defaults against defendants who had representation. So you see that 17% of um, judgments by default, but 735 cases as compared to more than 40,000 were entered against those defendants who did not have counsel. Um, of all small claims cases from 2013 to 2018 that end with a default favor in one party, uh, plaintiffs won 97% of the time, 97.6% of the time, and defendants only 2.4% of the time. And of these cases where a defendant won, the 2.4% of cases, 40% of those cases the defendant was a corporation, an LLC, a governmental entity, or a business entity. Um, so to close, you know, these analyses are really part of a new focus from Pew on Philadelphia's legal system. We'll have more research in the coming years about civil court and the practices in other jurisdictions. I'm going to turn it over to Lou. Thank you, Katie. And thank you, Stacy and Katie both and to Denise as well. Thank you all for attending. Um, this has given you, I think, a good perspective on this area of great need. Um, and I'd like to now bring this home to your role as volunteer attorneys, why this is so important for you to um, volunteer your expertise um, with VIP um, to represent folks who really need your help. Um, you know, when I think about volunteering and VIP, I think about a number of factors as to, to guide me in this, and I want to share them with you. Number one, um, what areas have unprecedented client need? And you've heard both on a national level and on a local level how important this is. One in four civil cases involve um, debt collection. Um, and in Philadelphia, uh, as Denise told you at the outset, we have the highest rate of poverty among the 10 most populous cities in, in America. Um, and in fact, uh, the highest deep poverty rate, which is at 50% of the poverty level among the most populous cities in America. So the need here is enormous um, and it will only grow as we emerge out of the pandemic. And this need, um, the fact that there's so little representation in this area and the extreme consequences that flow from it are not race neutral. They have disparate racial impact um, that Stacy shared with us on a national level and certainly uh, equally true on a Philadelphia level. 
Um, of course, we have a professional obligation under Rule 6.1. We'll look at that in a moment. Um, and the question is, how will we fulfill that obligation? And this is a wonderful area to fulfill that obligation. And I think it's particularly important because it's an area where there's such power imbalance. Um, I think as lawyers, we appreciate um, the role that we can play to really balance the scales of justice. Um, by the way, are you seeing my screen? I just realized that you might not be. Not yet, Lou. There you go. Yeah, so I apologize for that. Um, and so um, you haven't missed anything on the slides really, but um, that power imbalance is so critical here. Um, it's sort of, you know, David and Goliath. We as lawyers can make a real difference. Um, and at the same time, we can enhance our own professional skill development. I'm gonna talk about that in this area. Um, and uh, the bottom line is, and you saw that in both the national perspective and the local perspective, that what you do will make a real difference. And that's so important to us. And, um, and it's why you should um, consider this. So um, you heard about the prevalence of these kinds of cases. And um, one of the things I wanted to share with you that the reinvestment fund just did a study in Philadelphia. And that is when you look at who are the plaintiffs in these cases, they're repeat, they're repeat players over and over again. The four largest um, plaintiffs, um, look at the number of cases that they file. Um, and many of them are, are what we call debt buyers. And so there's a particular need here for lawyers to balance the scales of justice. Um, we're seeing these repeat players. They have a lot of leverage in the system and we can help to balance that out. Um, and at the same time, as you could see, um, there's the racial distribution um, that is anything but neutral and is so important for us to consider. Yes, rule 6.1 of the rules of professional conduct, you know, um, urge us to engage in voluntary pro bono publico service. Um, and one of the best ways we can do that is through individual representation by volunteering with VIP, taking cases where we can make a difference in the lives of individuals and families here in Philadelphia who have no one else to turn to. The real theme that you heard both on the national perspective and the local perspective that has to concern us and worry us as lawyers is the default judgment problem. That such a high percentage of cases are not getting heard on the merits of the cases, but are being decided um, for the plaintiffs um, by default. And there are lots of reasons for it. You heard some of those reasons. As lawyers, we need to address that. We need to figure out what is causing this. Is it the deficient service of process and people don't know about the proceedings? Is it the fact that people who do know about it feel overwhelmed and don't know where to turn for help? Is it that they can't afford to take off from work to attend court or they can't handle childcare issues uh, in order to attend? Um, do they feel that it's not a legal problem and they don't know what lawyers could do on their behalf? Um, or are they deferring what the consequences may be? Um, and so here we have a central role to play um, to address default judgments um, and to give folks the opportunity to have their claims and defenses heard and cases decided on the merits. Um, you know, you saw a number of studies and there are more studies and they, they all pretty much confirm that the rate of defaults are somewhere between 65 and even 95% of the cases, depending on the jurisdiction. Um, and what we know is that almost overwhelmingly, 95% as much, um, cases just don't have lawyers uh, for the defense while they have lawyers for the plaintiffs. And that is a recipe for disaster. So when we look, and here's um, from Katie's um, report at Pew, um, and I wanted to share this with you, when you look at small claims cases in municipal court in Philadelphia, you know, uh, if you look just at 2018, you're looking at the percentage of cases, um, you see the default at 95% of the total small claims cases 
that resulted in a judgment in our municipal court. Um, that's an unacceptable prospect and we can do something about it. Senator Warren, um, I thought captured it nicely. Even for those who do show up and do respond, um, it's like throwing folks to the wolves, right? Um, you're dealing with repeat players um, who have uh, knowledge, information, lawyers, uh, intimidation, um, and folks who show up unrepresented, don't know the rules of the game, uh, and they are overmatched. And they unfortunately um, enter into payment plans and judgments against them that often are not in their in best interests simply because they don't have the help that they need. Equally important, and you saw this as well in the reports, is what we have, what was uh, identified by a Human Rights Watch um, report as judgeless courtrooms. People get notices to appear in court. And when they show up in court, and particularly in what we call courtroom five here in Philadelphia Municipal Court, rather than having their case heard, um, they are then shuffled into a back room to meet with uh, the attorney for the plaintiff. And they gauge in a negotiation, and I use that term loosely, in which they are uh, often intimidated to enter into payment plans or judgments by agreement um, that really don't serve their interests. Um, and in this way, the courts are able to dispose of large numbers of cases. But with what quality of justice for the folks who have come through those courts and without regard to the long-term consequences that will befall them? That is our courtroom number five in Philadelphia Municipal Court. It's one that needs enormous reform. The Human Rights Watch report um, observed this courtroom and overheard some of those conversations. And I've highlighted for you one of the conversations. And the plaintiff's attorney was saying to a person who showed up unrepresented, you have been summoned here because you owe a debt that you failed to repay. You can have a trial if you want, but believe me, it will be better for you if you just agree to a payment plan with me right now. Faced with that, most people do exactly that. They overpromise what they can pay. They enter into a judgment by agreement. Um, and, um, uh, and they never have really any scrutiny of whether or not they owe what is claimed. So what can the lawyer do? And there's so much that the lawyer can do. The lawyer can engage in client interviewing an investigation of the documents and of the transactions that have taken place. They can engage in client counseling to advise a client as to the client's financial situation, the potential remedies available to the client, um, to give if it, they um, do enter into agreements to make sure those agreements are reasonable under the circumstances. And they can balance those scales in order to have leverage in negotiation with the plaintiff and the plaintiff's attorney um, to make it a fair negotiation and a fair result. They can file counterclaims, pleadings, motions to dismiss, necessary things that lawyers do to again balance the scales and to give your client leverage so that you can have a fair resolution of the dispute without which um, it's just unfair. And then finally, if a resolution cannot be achieved amicably, um, you can represent your client in hearings in court where you can present testimony, you cross-examine witnesses, you can present documents and use the rules of evidence um, to your benefit. And ultimately, if you take a VIP case, you're not obligated to take an appeal should there be an unsatisfactory result, but you should know that a client coming from municipal court has a de novo right of appeal to the Court of Common Pleas. And these cases would go to compulsory arbitration in the Court of Common Pleas. You've heard about municipal court. Um, it's located at 1339 Chestnut Street on the sixth floor. For those of you who are not familiar with it, 
It uh, has a number of divisions. Landlord tenant, you've probably heard a lot about where there've been a lot of reforms and where small claims cases have lagged behind, frankly, in, in achieving those reforms. We do have electronic filing in municipal court, so you don't have to go to the courthouse. You can access all of the information right um, online electronically. The rules of civil procedure do apply and municipal court has its own um, local rules that will supplement the rules of civil procedure. And I've highlighted a few here because they're particularly relevant to you if you're representing a defendant in a case. Rule 109 that will lay out what the contents of a complaint um, will need to have and which you will often find lacking in the complaints that are filed, particularly by debt buyers in this arena. Um, your opportunity to defend and to file counterclaims are critical. Your clients will be screened for their financial eligibility by VIP. They'll be eligible to proceed in form of porpoise, which means that any filings you will do, you'll be able to apply to the court to do those without any costs to the client. Um, you can accompany your client in courtroom five and engage in those negotiations and make them fair. Um, if um, agreements are reached, you can, you can uh, use your expertise and your strategies to avoid judgments by agreement, which are very detrimental. Um, um, they may be appropriate in some circumstances, um, but you want to try your best to avoid judgments against defendants because those can affect their housing, their future credit ratings, um, and their ability to emerge from periods of loss of employment and the like. Um, lawyers are trained in evidence and there's great opportunity to apply the rules of evidence in municipal court in these proceedings, particularly around business records and um, the abuse of the business rec records exception to the hearsay rule by plaintiffs for um, creditors in these proceedings. And you should know that municipal court is set up in both in-person hearings and Zoom by request. So your clients can attend by Zoom, you can attend by Zoom if appropriate, um, or you can attend in person. And as I mentioned, there are appeals. Um, I'm, this is not a substantive training, but I want you to know, um, sometimes you will hear that, well, what can lawyers do? My client owes the debt. But in fact, there are so many things that lawyers can do. And I've listed up here legal defenses, if you will, things we can do. Um, so often, um, these plaintiffs are debt buyers and they have not established that they really own the debt, that they have bought it. They've not provided the necessary contracts to prove it. So there's real questions about whether they have standing, whether or not they're a real party in interest whether they've complied with rule 109 and all of its requirements. Um, and we know there's a shameful American experience with robo signing of verifications in, in the purchase of these debts. And so you can scrutinize this and protect your clients. Um, debt collectors may not be licensed. The debt may not be your own clients. Um, there may be unauthorized charges in this debt or it may be identity theft victimization. Um, these are all things you'll want to look at. Um, the statute of limitations may have run. Ma in many of these cases, this is very old debt. There's a four-year statute of limitations in Pennsylvania, and the debt may precede that statute of limitations. There's choice of law issues here. Um, the contracts may require that Delaware law govern, and Delaware has even a shorter statute of limitations than Pennsylvania. And so that's something lawyers can apply. Um, there may be abusive debt collection practices, late night calls, calls to employers, threats that people will be thrown in jail or lose their homes and uh, things that may be um, illegal. Uh, and you can apply statutory defenses there. Um, you'll use your usual um, uh, scrutiny of elements of the cause of action and whether or not the plaintiff has met those and pled them properly. There may be payment protection plans on debt um, that exist, and you wouldn't know that until you saw the documents. Um, and there's federal and state legislation 
um, this is a heavily regulated area. And so you'll get an opportunity to learn more about the Federal Fair Debt Collection Practices Act that governs particularly initial communications between a creditor and a debtor. And often the creditor has not complied with those requirements. Our Unfair Trade Practices Act that uh, protects against uh, uh, unscrupulous and misrepresentations in the collection of uh, these debts and Truth in Lending Act that also provides protections in terms of charges for interest and uh, other fees um, when their uh, creditor is not sending out periodic statements. Um, and again, evidentiary challenges to business records. Uh, we see creditors trying to use business records of a prior creditor and there's very important objections to that that should be made. And remember that charges for interest and attorney fees and other kinds of fees are not permitted unless authorized by contract. Um, and we often find that they're not necessarily authorized by contract um, and, or they have not provided the contracts that would grant those authorizations. Um, and then finally, um, these debt buyers are paying just cents on a dollar, three cents, four cents, as maybe as much as seven cents on a dollar. What should be the proper measure of damages? Is there unjust enrichment? Let me end on this slide. You not only can provide individual representation in all of these ways that make such a difference to a family, but you also can be part of a larger picture and to step back and see where these injustices are and how you can be part of the solution, how you can apply your expertise. We're doing this in the landlord tenant area. We've adopted many reforms in landlord tenant because volunteer lawyers together with legal aid lawyers and city council and our courts have come together to enact very critical reforms that are beginning to balance the scales of justice. And we can do that in this critical area as well with your help. And we can make changes in the way the courts address these cases. We can um, really stop aggressive illegal practices. We can have more regulation where appropriate. We can have courts play a meaningful role in scrutinizing these debts. And finally, and so critically here, we can increase representation on behalf of debtors so that we have a fair and just system. With your help, we can make a difference and I urge you to volunteer for VIP. Thank you for your attention to this and I'll stop sharing now. Thank you so much for that, Lou, that was well said. Um, before I get into my spiel about how you can volunteer with VIP and talk about our available cases, I'd like to reserve some time to take questions. We did have a question in the chat that I'll ask first. Um, it says, I have a lot of cases where default judgments are sent out of state to have writs issued where the defendant has no opportunity to travel to foreign states to exercise exemptions to garnishment. How do we stop this? It's a two-part question, so I'll stop there. Any thoughts from any of our presenters? I'll jump in there if that's okay. Um, what we've done, and we just had one actually from an out-of-state um, coming into Pennsylvania, um, we sometimes contact clinics, for example, at law schools in those jurisdictions um, to raise whatever defenses or exemptions might be appropriate in a jurisdiction that we obviously can't travel to, we're not barred and, and can't appear in, our clients can't certainly go out there. Um, so you should think about a national network. We have a legal aid network with legal aid offices in, in all of the counties and in states uh, around the country. And we have law school clinics that are doing this kind of work. Um, so there's, there's opportunities to reach out and I would encourage that. Um, we're not alone. Thank you. Katie or Stacey, any comments? No? Okay. Do we have any other questions from the group? I'm gonna allow you all to... Um, Unmute yourselves if you would like to ask questions. I have a, a comment, not so much as a question. Hi, Alfonso. <laughs> Hi. Um, my name is Alfonso Madrid. I am a, a senior staff attorney at Community Legal Services. Um, and I do do some of these cases, but by bulk, uh, the 
most of our focus in our in the um, home ownership and consumer rights uh, unit is home ownership issues. So we're very limited in the amount of these cases that we can take. So um, having volunteer members from the bar take these cases is such a tremendous help. Um, and a lot of times people don't realize that um, this can have, you know, a small judgment can be an issue for home ownership later down the line. Um, I often had clients who had mortgage problems years later, and then these, these judgment liens come up and can raise an issue for them working out something with the mortgage company. So a lot of times you're not just saving somebody from, you know, a debt they're owed, you're saving their home. Um, so it's something to, to really think about, and I strongly encourage you. Um, these are actually very uh, fun cases to do. Um, and, you know, as, as uh, Lou pointed out, that de novo right of appeal really gives you a lot of, of um, leverage there. The fact of the matter is, you work for free, plaintiff's attorney doesn't. And just being, you know, putting your heels down and making them work to prove their case is quite oftentimes all you need to do to win these cases. Great. Thank you so much, Alfonso. Uh, well said, Alfonso. Well said. And CLS does such great work in so many areas, but it can't be everywhere and do everything. So we, we need the private bar to help out. And uh, these are great cases to Yeah, to another great program is civil expungement, which um, I do some volunteer work on that. And uh, I think that's a great program, especially for people that, you know, a lot of people, once the moratoriums are over, are going to need to move. And when they have the eviction and the judgment on their record, you know, and a lot of these are judgment by agreement, if we can get those removed... And I've had really good success. And the landlords and the attorney, well, mostly the attorneys, are very, very cooperative. Thank you, David. Yeah. Another great point, David. Um, you know, um, a lot of work is being done in that area, obviously in the landlord-tenant arena. Um, and we may see some real progress uh, soon in the uh, area of sealing records. And, um, and we have a lot of work to do here as well. But the more folks we have handling these cases, the more expertise we'll have to share, the more we can work on reform as well as individual representation. So thank you for your work. There are no other comments or questions. I'll just wrap up quickly. I'll share my screen with you again. Stacey, if you have to fly away, I understand, but thank you for being here with us today. Thanks for having me. I'm off to teach. Good luck, everyone. Thank you, Stacey. I hope everyone can see my screen again. Um, so saying yes, the process of volunteering. There are several ways you can volunteer with Philadelphia VIP. As you can see from the pictures on my screen, we have our cases available on our website at phillyvip.org. You can scroll through the different case types, but today, since we're talking about collections, we'll hope that you click on collections and see what's available. Uh, the other way is to sign up for our monthly case lists, which we would send to let you know which cases are available, especially our urgent issues that we have, which some collection cases end up becoming urgent because court dates are pending and no one's picked them up just yet. Um, other ways that you can reach out to a staff member, specifically myself directly, if you have an interest or if you just want someone to help you pick a case that is right for you. Um, and I think that is what I wanted to say about that resources. So you're never quite alone when you're taking a VIP case. We're always here to help you out in whatever we, we can. When we are in the office, we offer office support the best way we can, meaning meeting space or notary services. Obviously, because of COVID and being closed to the public, we've made some changes around that, but I'm happy to talk about that with anyone. Staff support, your case manager or other staff member that is in charge of the case will work with you closely to get you whatever you need in a case. Um, mentors. If you're not familiar with debt collection at all, we try to find our more experienced volunteers or more experienced staff members to work with you on a case. If our client is non-English speaking, we provide interpreter services where possible. And as Lou mentioned, we also supply you with forms to file IFP and form a for our clients to have all of their court fees waived where applicable. 
And then of course, there's always training opportunities. Today's was a seminar rather than a training necessarily, but I'm hoping to follow this up very soon with a more dedicated training on debt collection practices. And then there is our resource toolbox, which I think I spoke about briefly at the beginning, which has a ton of training manuals and forms that you would need to complete your case. So our available collection cases right now, I really just wanted to take this time to talk about two of our urgent case matters. You can record this number if you would like, if you have an interest and go back to our site or contact me directly about taking one of these cases. We currently have a client with a hearing coming up on May 12th. Um, the client is not currently able to negotiate a payment plan due to financial constraints. But as uh, Lou talked about, she is up against a well-known debt buyer, Midland Credit, and could really use some legal representation. The second urgent case, the client's court date is not until January of 2022. However, an answer is due to the complaint because this is a court of common pleas case and the answer is due before May 15th. This client is in a position to negotiate a settlement and would like to do so. Um, and uh, the client has some um, extenuating circumstances, including health issues and loss of a job due to the pandemic. So that's something to keep in mind if you were to help them out. Um, you could otherwise see our remaining collections cases at phillyvip.org and looking under our collections cases. And that is the conclusion of our seminar today. If you have any other qu questions or case interest, you can feel free to contact me. My email is dlynch at phillyvip.org or you may call me at 215-523-9563. And if there are no other questions, thank you all for joining us today. And I look forward to working with you again. Thank you again to our presenters, Lou, Katie, and Stacy. and take care everybody. Thank you, Denise. Thank you.